It's everyone's favorite. Big time, small time, Love it. anytime. Whether it's vanilla, chocolate, or whatever. We need some M&Ms. How about brownies? Sure, all right, why not? We've got the scoop on this centuries old dessert in all of its flavorful forms. That's good. That's a 10. From the cow mm -hmm. to the cone, it's the untold story of ice cream on Modern Marvels. Welcome to a world like none you've ever seen. A magical land of ice cream floats, chocolate waterfalls, and frozen fantasies. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory ain't got nothing on us. This is the Dryers plant in Bakersfield, California, the world's largest and busiest ice cream factory. Each year, the 28 production lines churn out 90 different ice cream products, totaling over 100 million gallons. That helps satisfy the world's 4 billion gallon a year appetite. Not surprisingly, one of the leaders is the good old USA, where the average person downs 23.2 quarts a year. Ooh. We're all kids when it comes to ice cream. We all love it, you know, it's comfort food. You've had a bad day? Have a bowl of ice cream. You've had a good day? Celebrate with a bowl of ice cream. Today, ice cream production is a sophisticated and technologically advanced science. But the same basic principles from hundreds of years ago still apply. The way we make ice cream in the manufacturing scale is the same way that you would make ice cream at home in a hand-turned freezer. The differences are, obviously, we do it in scale in a continuous process rather than a batch process at home. The process begins with ice cream's most important ingredient, milk. The total liquid supply of this facility is about a half a million gallons. So we take those basic ingredients of milk, condensed milk, in cream coupled with sugars, and that makes the base mix. And we'll also add in cocoa powders and stabilizers into the mix room. Once the mix has been blended, it's piped to the pasteurizer, where it's heated to 179 degrees for 25 seconds to kill bacteria. Then it's homogenized, forced through tiny valves at a pressure of 4,000 pounds per square inch to break down and disperse the fat globules. Just like putting your thumb over a hose, it aspirates that mix and creates a very consistent or homogeneous product. The product is then cooled to 40 degrees before being pumped into the various flavor tanks. We'll add in the cherry flavors or the strawberry flavoring. And as we get into the freezer, now is where we begin to create the ice cream. The flavored mix is continuously pumped into the freezer and enters a long, cold cylinder that is jacketed by a liquid ammonia freezing agent. The temperature of the mix drops to 21 to 23 degrees. As the mix freezes to the walls of the cylinder, ice crystals are scraped off by the revolving blades of a paddle called a dasher. The blades have an additional purpose, whipping air into the mix, creating the frozen foam we know as ice cream. One of the largest ingredients inside ice cream that most people don't know is actually air. We call it overrun. Uh, premium products are required to have 100% overrun, so for every one cup of mix, we add one cup of air. In the US, ice cream must by definition contain at least 10% butterfat. When it's pumped out of the freezer, it has the consistency of soft serve. But that won't last for long. The carton's next head into the blast harder kept at a bone chilling 65 degrees below zero. Within hours, the ice cream's temperature will drop to zero degrees Fahrenheit. A blast hardener is really intended to draw all that heat out of it as fast as we can, because the colder we can get it, the faster we can get it, the less probability we have of creating ice crystals in the product. And ice crystals are really what create that grittiness feel in your mouth. So ice cream manufacturing is all about time and temperature not to mention taste. And no one knows that better than Dryer's official taste tester, John Harrison. 
a man whose tongue is so sensitive, it's been insured for a million dollars. What I look for in tasting ice cream is uh, three things. Uh, now, we all initially eat with our eyes, so it must look appetizing. Number two is the flavor and flavor balance. And thirdly is the body and texture. John's job is to make sure that each carton lives up to its premium label in terms of taste and presentation. So sort of like a wine taster. I start with the white wines of ice cream, vanilla, French vanilla, a vanilla bean, a double vanilla, and I work my way up to the, the heavy Bordeaux of ice cream, uh, such as a black walnut, a mint chocolate chip. When tasting ice cream, John uses a gold-plated spoon that doesn't leave an aftertaste. Pure vanilla. Mm. Uh, my tasting method is the three S's, which stands for swirl, smack, and spit. Mm. Whew. That's good. Cookies and cream. Uh, you don't have to swallow to taste. We swallow to get nutrition. You get the cream, the cookies, vanilla, sweetness. As you can see, I've been swallowing more than I should. <laughs> it's so good, though. <laughs> the ice cream John's tasting is very different from the world's first ice cream. I wish I could tell you ice cream was invented on this day with this person, but the fact is, we don't really know where ice cream was invented or when. We do know that there's lots of myths and legends around ice cream. Many believe the Emperor Nero would send slaves into the mountains to bring back snow and ice for snow ice cream, made with wine, fruit, and honey. Another legend has Marco Polo returning from China with a recipe for a sherbet-like dessert. Ice cream as we know and love it today really has its roots in Italy, where they call their ice cream gelato. The Italians really perfected ice cream in their cafes, in high society. We can thank the Italians for that. Compared to American ice cream, gelato contains less fat and less added air. As a result, it has a rich, creamier taste. Mm, <laughs> Gelato varies from region to region, and even within a city, you can have something very different. It's like rose water. But the Italians do tend to use more milk and less cream than American style ice cream. John Snyder is America's gelato guru. At Il Laboratorio del Gelato on New York's Lower East Side, he creates this centuries old dessert for more than 200 of Manhattan's finest restaurants. Today we're gonna to be making espresso gelato. And we begin with, uh, with just pure espresso beans. We use about a gallon of espresso beans for one batch of gelato. And this goes right in the blender with the beans. Next, John adds two gallons of a base mix consisting of milk, cream, and sugar. He then blends the mixture and heats it, infusing the beans into the mix. And just let this come to almost a boil, but not quite. An hour later, it's time to strain out the beans. John then adds a little fresh brewed coffee to the bean and milk concoction and pours it into a gelato machine for churning and freezing. Three additional gallons of base mix round out the recipe. Well, the recipes that I've created are based on years of a lot of tasting in my travels all over the world. We try and make just the very best and the, also the very purest. And I can start taking it out. 20 minutes later, it's gelato time. This gelato will give you a pretty good jolt. Espresso, best way to start your day. It's doubtful whether America's founding fathers started their days off with espresso gelato, but they did enjoy their ice cream. George Washington was a fan. Thomas Jefferson had a weakness for vanilla. And Dolly Madison served it at her husband's second inauguration. But it was the invention of the salt and ice hand-cranked batch freezer in 1846 by housewife Nancy Johnson that turned ice cream into a household food that everyone could enjoy. That old homemade method is still revered at Penn State University the country's leading authority on the making of ice cream. 
We'll use this demonstration with the salt and ice freezer to demonstrate the basic principles that underlie freezing of ice cream mix into ice cream. The freezing cylinder will be charged to be roughly half full of ice cream mix. Then the scraping mechanism is inserted into the freezing system. Now this freezer is very similar to the freezer that Nancy Johnson developed in 1846, except that we have an electric motor rather than a hand crank. Salt and ice are added to act as the freezing agent. They form a brine solution, which has a very low freezing point. As the brine absorbs heat from the ice cream mix in the cylinder, the mix itself begins to freeze. And you'll notice that in this system, the scraper mechanism is fixed, and the cylinder rotates around the scraper mechanism here. 45 minutes later, the ice cream is ready. Oh, and you can see that this is whipped up nicely. If you look carefully, you can see little, um, little balls, and you'll see this kind of stringiness. A part of this is due to the ice, and part of this is also due to destabilized fat that's in the ice cream um, because of the long, slow churning process. But this is truly homemade ice cream. While most of today's ice cream makers have abandoned the old-fashioned methods, tradition lives on at Graters, a family-run business in Cincinnati. We are the only ice cream company, I think, anywhere in the world that uses the French pot method of making ice cream. And if you Google French pot, you'll find us and nobody else. Graters is a fourth generation company that has been making ice cream the same basic way for more than 130 years. The process begins with pouring two gallons of ice cream mix into one of Graters' unique French pots. This is a very similar ice cream freezer to what we started with in 1870. Um, it's been modernized slightly, mechanicalized in modern refrigeration. What it consists of is a five gallon stainless steel drum submerged in calcium chloride. As the pot slowly spins, the mix begins to freeze against its sides. A blade softly scrapes the sides, folding the ice cream into itself. This folding process prevents air from whipping into the ice cream and accounts for its thick and creamy consistency. The reason no one else uses the French pot today is that it's so labor intensive. You can only make two gallons per machine, and modern ice cream machines, even the small ones, will make 10 gallons in 10 minutes. After 15 minutes of spinning, the ice cream is ready to be packed. But it's so dense that no equipment can handle it. Where all of our pints are hand packed, um, there is no automation back there. Our packing machine is named Bud. Um, we pack about 6,000 pints that, that way on a daily basis. Where a typical pint of ice cream may weigh as little as eight ounces, a grater's pint weighs nearly a full pound. The unique thing about grater's ice cream is it is just like what your great-grandparents would have had over 100 years ago. We are literally the only people in the world that continue to use the French pot process to make ice cream and we're still making it just two gallons at a time. By the late 1800s, people were getting their ice cream at mom and pop soda fountains, like this one, Aglamesis Brothers in Cincinnati. When you walk into a nostalgic ice cream parlor like this, you're really coming back to a place that doesn't really exist anymore on this planet. This shop is only one of a handful of soda fountains that remains from the period. This is the authentic ice cream fountain that we've had since this building was built in 1913. Our formulas are actually the same as they were many years ago in respect to uh, cream, honey, eggs, and sugar in our product. What flavor do you like? The late 1800s ushered in an era of ice cream innovations. Among them, a colorful combination that included ice cream, flavored toppings, and whipped cream the ice cream sundae. More than half a dozen communities claim to be its birthplace. Everywhere from Two Rivers, Wisconsin, where a historical marker commemorates the event, 
Yeah, the community has always taken great pride in the history of being home of the ice cream sundae, invented by one Ed Berners at his ice cream parlor in the Franklin House building in 1881. To Ithaca, New York. Uh, the story uh, that's claimed in Ithaca is that the sundae was invented in 1892 at Colt and Platt's Pharmacy. There is no documentation for the Burner story and several pieces of documentation for the Ithaca story. To Evanston, Illinois. One pharmacist in Evanston, according to legend, um, decided to serve ice cream with syrup on Sunday as a way of driving sales. And out of respect for the Lord's name, he changed the spelling from D-A-Y to D-A-E. We may never know who really invented the ice cream sundae, but we do know every Sunday needs a dish. And if you don't have a dish, you'd better have ice cream's most trusted companion, the cone. For hundreds of years, ice cream was content to go it alone, served up in dishes, bowls, and glasses. But since the turn of the 20th century, it's been married to the perfect partner. That would be the cone. A wonderful little invention with but one purpose. Cones are, are really a vehicle just to eat ice cream. So uh, you don't buy cones unless you're buying ice cream. And by the looks of things, people are buying a whole lot of ice cream. This is the Joy Cone Company in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, the world's largest ice cream cone plant. Every year, Joy Cone turns out a staggering 1.5 billion cones. That's over five and a half million cones every day. Amazing when you consider the genesis of the first cone. And there's a couple different competing theories, but the one that we adhere to is in the 1904 World's Fair, it was in St. Louis, and there was two vendors. One was making waffles, and the person next to him was selling scoops of ice cream in a dish. Well, the ice cream vendor ran out of dishes, and so the waffle cone vendor folded the waffle into a conical shape. And so they started serving the ice cream inside the waffle, and it was developed as the waffle cone. Waffle cones are still being made at Joy Cone, as are sugar cones and the crispy flat-bottomed cake cones. A cake cone is made with the, some basic ingredients flour, tapioca flour, water, sugar, and then minor ingredients. The ingredients are dumped into a mixer, cooled, and then pumped as a liquid batter into the ovens. With the cake cones, it's a molded product. Batter's formed into the mold, and then a plug drops into the mold, so the batter forms between the cavity and the plug. It goes in liquid, 90 seconds later, it'll drop out as a fully formed cone. And as you can see, we're making color cups today. The cones come out of the oven at about 350 degrees, and they come down this conveyor to cool off before they're packed onto the conveyor. This oven is gonna generate over 120,000 cones in a single day, and the whole line, over 700,000 cones in one day. Quality control is never a problem at Joy Cone with CEO Joe George working the floor. You want it to be well baked without being burnt in any spot. And you want it to be soft in texture without being too weak. And it's got to taste good. And this one passes the test. Unlike the molded cake cones, sugar cones and waffle cones are rolled products baked flat in the oven. Once they're warm and malleable, they're dropped upon a spinner that forms the actual cone shape. This is our sugar cone machine, which produces 10,000 cones an hour, or 240,000 cones a day. When we make all these cones, we want to have, make sure it's excellent taste. But we also need to make sure it's a nice sealed tip, because we want to make sure that you're eating the ice cream and not wearing it. Now you try it. The there folks at Baskin Robbins have turned filling ice cream cones into an art form. There you go. All workers are trained in the proper technique for making the perfect Trigger. four ounce scoop. Not too bad. 
One of our Baskin Robbins franchisees, Mitch Cohn from New York, holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most scoops successfully executed and applied to a cone in one minute. He did 19 of them. Now we're going to make the perfect scoop using the Baskin Robbins custom ice cream scoop. Want to get in there, get a big chunk, get the ice cream to roll around inside the scoop, make a second pass at it to tighten it up, bring it back, apply it firmly but gently to this cone, and there you go. Perfect ice cream scoop. And how many licks does it take to put away a scoop of ice cream? Who better to ask than John Harrison? the man with a million dollar tongue. A, a typical cone, uh, one scoop, looking at four fluid ounces, it takes about 50 licks uh, to polish off that scoop of ice cream. We decided to put that number to the test. This lucky lady needed a hundred licks and a half dozen bites. But ice cream consumption can have its headaches, literally. At Penn State University, we learned about the most common, the dreaded brain freeze. After the ice cream is taken in and comes in contact with the upper palate of the mouth, it constricts these blood vessels and it restricts the, the flow of blood. A few seconds later, the palate is rewarmed and these blood vessels dilate and the blood returns to normal. At this point, the blood rush back to the palate is rather significant and the nerve endings in the upper roof of the mouth sense this as pain. So it's not the ingestion of the cold ice cream, it's actually the return of the warmth after the ice cream is swallowed. And this pain then is transferred to the forehead as a very severe but brief headache. And the cure for the freeze? I would recommend taking smaller portions uh, at a time or licking smaller portions of ice cream off the cone or eating it from the dish. But you knew that, didn't you? Of course, the cone isn't the only way to eat ice cream with one hand. The ice cream bar was invented in the 1920s when a young boy came into a confectioner's shop in Iowa by the name of Christian Nelson. And the boy only had a nickel, and he couldn't decide between buying ice cream and buying chocolate. And he wanted to have both. And that got Christian Nelson to thinking, how could I put these two things together to satisfy this customer? And what he invented became the Eskimo pie as we know it. Today, the Eskimo pie and its offshoot, the Eskimo pie crunch bar, are born at the Dryers plant in Bakersfield. So this is what we would call a molded product. And the mold is essentially just like you'd make an ice cube at home, where you put water into an ice cube tray, only we do it in a much larger scale. That means 20,000 bars every hour. You spray the ice cream inside the mold, and then on the bottom of that, we spray 55 degree below zero brine solution to actually freeze out the product inside that mold. Bar then comes around where it begins to firm up, and we put a stick inside it. One more revolution, and the bars are dumped into a dip tank. That's where a chocolate and puffed rice coating is applied to the crunch bar. Then it's off to be packaged and distributed nationwide. But ice cream has a soft side, too. And that's an industry unto itself. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Today, ice cream franchises are as much a part of our landscape as ice cream itself. Their roots can be traced to the early days of another great American institution, the automobile. As Americans began to use automobiles to get around, it really transformed the way we enjoyed ice cream. As they started to drive to roadside stands and get ice cream right from the stand, typically they served soft serve. And that really also changed the face of ice cream. Soft serve has less butter fat and less added air than hard ice cream. And because it's served at a higher temperature, 18 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to five or 10 degrees with hard ice cream, its flavors are more pronounced. Ice cream being colder 
you have less flavor release. It has a numbing effect on your taste buds, where at 18 degrees, there's more flavor that comes through. The ice cream stands could pump out soft serve or frozen custard, a derivative made with egg yolks right on the premises. The invention of a revolutionary freezer that could continuously dispense a semi-frozen dessert made it all possible. While today's soft serve freezers are far more advanced, they do share many of the same features. In a typical ice cream freezer, ice cream is added to the freezing cylinder, it's frozen, it's drawn off, and then it's frozen uh, in the hardening room quiescently. In the case of the soft serve ice cream freezer, ice cream is available on demand. You get ice cream where all of the freezing has been done only in the uh, agitated freezing cylinder. The design of a key part of the soft serve freezer, the dasher, is also unique. And you can see these uh, plastic pieces which fit over the metal and lock in are going to be actually the scraping mechanism. They'll scrape the ice cream off the walls of the freezer. You'll also notice this helical design which is going to push the ice cream forward so that it'll be ready to draw out at any given time. So now the ice cream's ready. The soft serve is a little warmer than the typical hard ice cream, which makes it eat a little bit better, so it's soft and refreshing, and it's ready all day long. One of the first men to see a future in soft serve was J.F. Grandpa McCullough, who along with his son Alex created Dairy Queen, the cone with a curl on top. In their ice cream plant that they owned and operated, they dispensed ice cream in a soft state out of their freezers on a daily basis. They wanted to deliver that same product to the consumers. So they connected with a friend of theirs who had a walk-up stand. And they did a test run one day. And in two hours, they served more than 1,600 servings of this ice cream. So they knew they were onto something. It didn't take long for Dairy Queen to become part of American culture. Dairy Queen tended to go into towns that were smaller, and it became part of the corner hangout where you walked up to get your soft serve cone and talk to your neighbors and then walk back home. Today, Galloway Brothers of Nina, Wisconsin, is one of several plants that produce the base mix for Dairy Queen. The ingredients that go into the mix are almost the same as those in hard ice cream, but the precise formula remains a closely guarded secret. For Dairy Queen, they have a formula that we must beat. So much sugar, so much butterfat, so much milk. The milk is trucked in daily from local dairies, stored in one of several silos, and then piped into a blending tank. This is where we blend all of the ingredients that go into Dairy Queen. The computer has a list of ingredients such as sucrose, corn syrup, cream, condensed skim milk, and milk. It blends them based on weight with a Coriolis meter. The dry ingredients are added up here. This basically is a great big wearing blender. We put the sucrose and corn syrup in here, then add the dry ingredients, such as stabilizers and flavor. After the mix is blended, it's pumped into a ballast tank, heated, pasteurized, homogenized, and then cooled. Behind me is the final operation in the Dairy Queen manufacturing process. This is our packaging operation. Each machine can fill a six gallon bag in about five seconds. That's enough to make about 4,000 cones in one minute. Dairy Queen is the world's largest soft serve franchise with over 5,700 locations in North America alone. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. But since the 1970s, the soft serve scene has become a bit more crowded, thanks to frozen yogurt. Frozen yogurt really started out as frozen yogurt, uh, which was a, a very acid, uh, highly flavored product, and that didn't sell very well. So the problem was is it didn't taste so great. It was a little bitter, and it wasn't as sweet as ice cream consumers were used to having. Uh, it wasn't until the early 80s that a couple companies started playing around with the yogurt levels and going for a lower acid profile that all of a sudden it reached a great deal of consumer acceptance 
and uh, that's when TCBY really started up in 1981. And just how did frozen yogurt makers like TCBY succeed? By making their product taste less like yogurt and more like ice cream. It all begins with a mix, produced at Scott Brothers Dairy in Chino, California. What distinguishes us, of course, is the fact that we add a significant amount of yogurt. That yogurt is made in these tanks right here. They're called our culture tanks. We actually cultured about 106 to 107 degrees Fahrenheit to help the cultures grow a little bit faster. It takes seven and a half hours to prepare the yogurt cultures. Flavors are added. Then it's all combined with a base mix and packaged. The levels of live at the cultures in our yogurt are very high. Uh, 25 million per gram is right uh, where those uh, good yogurts that are proclaiming live at the cultures are. I think that's the big surprise. My God, that's really yogurt? In the past, there was rumors that frozen yogurt really wasn't yogurt. For us, that's not the case. Studies suggest that live active cultures improve immunity and digestion. There are other health benefits as well. Our yogurt is 50% less calories and 80% less fat than a comparable serving of ice cream. It's just like fresh yogurt, but you get it in a way that you just love the taste. In recent years, several new establishments have come full circle in frozen yogurt and are now selling a tangy tasting product. Among them, Pinkberry, which has attracted an almost cult-like following in New York and California. I'm here at least four times a week, most of the time more than once a day, so much so that they know my name. <laughs> Pinkberry calls it frozen yogurt reinvented. It tastes so different than like every other frozen yogurt or ice cream, it's ridiculous. It's like a perfect blend of like sweet and sour and fruity and crunchy, <laughs> like all the same night. But whether you're having frozen yogurt or good old fashioned ice cream, the key is how much you eat. Have a good day. Ice cream is an excellent source of protein. It's an excellent source of calcium. It is an excellent source of energy. The problem is if you consume ice cream as a staple, then you're consuming too many uh, calories and too many calories from fat. For many ice cream lovers, calories are a necessary evil. These folks flip over the high-end, highly dense premium ice creams. There was a time when there were only three flavors of ice cream. That figure is now ballooned into the hundreds, if not thousands. But for sheer outrageousness, nothing tops the flavorful creations of Ben and Jerry's. We make great, fun, funky, chunky ice cream, lots of big chunks in it, swirls. We make the ice cream impossible flavor possible. Vermont's most popular tourist attraction began in 1978 as a tiny homemade ice cream parlor run by childhood friends Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield. Interestingly enough, ice cream wasn't their first choice. We originally thought about bagels, uh, checked out bagel making equipment, found out it was more money than we had, and figured ice cream had to be cheaper. 30 years later, Ben & Jerry's is a cultural institution. Ben & Jerry's ice cream is made with all natural ingredients. So we start right here in Vermont with lots of fresh dairy that we get here, milk and cream, sugar, uh, eggs. We're also going to be adding in other great ingredients that we use as add-ins. The add-ins, or inclusions, can range from broken pieces of popular candy bars to fruits and nuts of every shape and size. You chew when you eat your ice cream. That was one of the, the bases of when they made their ice cream. We're going to have ice cream, we're going to chew it, is what Ben & Jerry started. Chunky Monkey is one of Ben & Jerry's most popular flavors. Like most factory-made ice creams, it begins as a mix. Then come the add-ins, walnuts and pieces of chocolate. So this is where we bring Ben & Jerry's to life. This is where we know it as our chunk feeder, where we add fruit, we add chunks, not chips, we add serious chunks. The serious chunks first go into the hopper, a bin that can hold up to 14 gallons of ingredients which next drop into the enrobing chamber. 
there. A star wheel determines the amount of chunks to go into the ice cream mix by rotating at different speeds. The ice cream then enters the four foot long blender tube where an agitator made up of several paddles rotates and evenly distributes the chunks. From there, the ice cream continues to the automatic filler. Every day, the plant turns out about 320,000 pints. So this is the end of the line before it hits the deep freeze. This is where no one gets to see it, and it's a nice, soft serve, creamy. This is good stuff. You would think in a company as wildly successful as Ben & Jerry's, every flavor would be a hit. Not so. We had a vanilla ice cream with gummy worms in it, but the worms would freeze solid, so it was too much chew. We've tried a hot chocolate, which was a chocolate ice cream with uh, jalapeno peppers in it. We've even tried some more savory, less dessert kind of flavors, like sour cream and onion ice cream. Not very popular. What is popular, at least among some brave souls, is the party in a bucket, known as the Vermonster. You can get it at every one of Ben & Jerry's 650 scoop shops. The Vermonster is made up with 20 scoops of ice cream. You get to choose the flavors. We we'll cut up four bananas into each Vermonster. We'll scoop in a couple handfuls of chocolate chip cookie pieces. We'll then scoop in brownies, all chunked up. You can get additional toppings as per your choice. We always top off the Vermonster with plenty of whipped cream. We also add in four ladles of hot fudge. And there you have it. Great. Just who are the people who come up with all the Ben & Jerry flavors? Sometimes I feel like a mad scientist. Meet Peter Lind, the man behind such flavors as wavy gravy, and chocolate chip cookie dough. It's more um, working from what your taste buds are telling you, what works together well, what textures connect. Today, he's working on creating a pint-sized version of the Vermonster. It begins with plain vanilla ice cream. Then, Peter starts working his magic. We need some chips, right? We gotta have chips. We're gonna have a little cookie dough. We'll put that in there. A little cookie dough. Uh, how about uh, how about brownies? Sure, all right, why not? I like brownies. And some chocolate chip cookies for a different texture. And well, let's put some cherries in. I know, cherries, wow, okay. Kind of Sunday type of thing going on. Now, I will mix these up. There we go, nice, nice. Oh, I don't know, I think we need some M&Ms. Yeah, I think we need some M&M's. This is a Vermonster, which does have M&M. All right, so I'm going to pop it right into my pastry bag here. All it needs now is a little fudge. Then it's off to the freezer. 20 minutes later, the moment of truth. Good crunch, good viscosity on the fudge. Good mushiness on the banana. Mm. I could do this. This is a good start for a mini Vermonster. You might think Ben and Jerry's has pushed ice cream to its limits. But some folks have taken things even further. Are these liquid nitrogen created balls the future of ice cream? Ice cream can take the form of everything from a fudge-covered whale to specialty desserts that defy description. But what does the future hold for this ever-evolving treat? One company claims to already have the answer. The same way that, that a microwave oven reinvented the way that people cook their food, we've somewhat reinvented the way that people think of ice cream. This is Dippin' Dots the self-proclaimed ice cream of the future. Here in this nondescript Paducah, Kentucky plant, folks are churning out a unique product. Unique because of its beaded shape, but also because it's been frozen cryogenically using liquid nitrogen. The process was the brainchild of microbiologist Kurt Jones. I had been working on a 
a project at work where we were freezing yogurt cultures, and I had developed a way to do it using liquid nitrogen, which is 320 below zero. It just made me think, I wonder if I could freeze ice cream in the same way and how it would react. Kurt soon had his answer, and the result is Dippin' Dots. It all begins with a standard pasteurized mix that is flavored with one of Dippin' Dots' 30 flavors. That's when the fun begins. Once we've completed the flavoring process, the product is then transferred to what you see behind me, a cryogenic processor. In the top of the processor, there's an instrument that allows a measured amount of mix to come into contact with liquid nitrogen, and then it freezes instantly. That instrument at the top of the processor functions like an eyedropper, releasing the mix in tiny droplets. When the droplets hit the liquid nitrogen, they're flash frozen into beads that descend like BBs. An inclined auger releases a gallon of beads into each bag. Due to this radical freezing technique, the beads contain only the tiniest ice crystals and almost no air. They're also a lot colder than regular ice cream, coming in at minus 20 degrees. Scientifically speaking, it gives it a very, very creamy, smooth taste, even though it's a real fun and novel product. The beads are immediately packed into bags to be shipped worldwide. To maintain their creaminess, they're stored in the subarctic minus 50 degree freezer. Lots of times we like to tell everybody it's the largest, coldest freezer in America because at that temperature it stores more product than any product like that in the U.S. In 2007 alone, Dippin' Dot sold more than two million gallons of the chili beads. You'd have to have brain freeze to scoff at those numbers. The future also looks bright for another innovative ice cream, Slow Churn, first developed at Dryers. And we spent $20 million, uh, 15 years, in developing what is called Slow Churn, which is not added ingredients, it's a process. And this process uh, takes the temperature down and we freeze it much colder. And by doing so, you have a real fine texture that gives a creaminess with great appearance and great flavor. Compared to regular ice cream, slow churn has only half the fat and 30% fewer calories. And essentially what we do is we create the perception in your mouth that the same amount of butterfat is there. By taking that butterfat and spreading it out to create a higher surface area relative to the volume of butterfat, and that then tricks your mouth into thinking, I ate a whole lot of butterfat. In recent years, nearly every ice cream manufacturer has come out with a slow churned type of low fat alternative. The future of ice cream is bright. We grew up with America and ice cream, and it's become the number one dessert in America. But there's still some star flavors yet to be created.